Our sacred story this morning is the opening lines of Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. It is the first chapter, verse, verses 1 through 5. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for, for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be the saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the sacred story of God and God's people. And still, still speaking, speaking God, God speak, speak to, to us this day. day. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Marie. I'm going to kind of bounce one off the kids here for the rest of the congregation. Think of this as a little commencement address for y'all, but hopefully the rest of y'all get something out of it as well. So there's a woman named Bonnie Ware. She was uh, a palliative nurse. She, did, uh, she was a hospice care worker for most of her career, and um, she would work with people. I mean, y'all know what hospice care people do. She, she worked with people who were uh, in the last three to 12 months of their life. And one of the things that she had to do was she had to uh, really ha help people come to peace with the fact that they were going to be dying. And so one of the questions that she would often ask them is, if you had any regret, what would they be? And after talking to dozens of people, she kind of came down with five basic themes, five different things that, that people had said that as they looked forward, as, as they were about to breathe their last, and they were about to take that first step into life beyond life, and they were looking back at their, at their life, like what regrets what they would have, and she came up with five that were pretty much the themes of what everyone kind of said. The first was, I wish that I had had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life that others expected me to be. I wish I hadn't worked so hard which can be translated as, I wish I hadn't worked so much. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I don't necessarily know if she meant most, that was mostly her male uh, patients, but men have a hard time expressing ourselves sometimes, so expressing our feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends, and I wish that I would have let myself be happier. And it's this fourth one, this fourth regret, I wish I would have stayed in touch with my friends that I really want to talk to you guys about. So people in hospice care, they had expressed these deep regrets, and it's funny that as they were on their deathbed, as they're, again, just ready to pass, it wasn't their accomplishments, it wasn't their st status, it wasn't how much money they had made that they looked back and had regrets on. The thing that they regretted so much was the fact that as they got older, in high school, it's really easy to have your group of friends. It may be two or three really close friends. It might be 50 or 60, um, you know, big group of friends. But it's so easy in school and college as well to have friends. But once you take that step, sometimes those friendships become strayed and, they, and, they, and, and you lose touch of them. And as people were getting older and as they were about to die, they regretted the fact that they didn't take the time to keep close friendships because that's really what it all boils down to. It's not your status, it's not your money, it's not your accomplishments. It's the relationships that you have. When you're really looking back on it and you're about to breathe your last, that's what you're going to look back on and say what really mattered. So Rex and Jonathan and Marie and this pomp and circumstance days when you're going to be given the charge to carpe diem, seize the day, you should know that what you need to seize today and each and every day from here on out until you have no more days left and you don't know when that will be is you need to cultivate, create, and maintain solid, true, authentic, loving relationships. 
If you do that, you will live a life of meaning. So the Apostle Paul, he teaches us something about lasting friendships. So he's, as what Marie read to us, he's actually sitting in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to get out of prison. This, he was in prison a lot. He got in trouble a lot. And he doesn't know if he's going to make it to Rome. So he writes a letter to the, group, uh, to the Christians in Rome saying, like, I hope that I get there, but I might not. So this is his letter from Birmingham jail. This is his big treatise. This is like, I don't know if I'm going to get out of it this time. And this is what he did. Because Paul was constantly on the go. He was moving and shaking. He was doing. He was going around to different communities. And every time he did, he would meet new people. He would cultivate those friendships. He'd build a community. And then after that got kind of situated, he'd go on to the next one. And there were two things that the Apostle Paul was really dedicated to. The first was, as soon as he had his epiphany experience, the light of God shone on him and he converted, he was dedicated to his faith. It meant so much to him. And the second thing was, he was dedicated to his friends. So this journey that he was on, all these places that he was going, he never went by himself. He always went with a buddy. Road trip! And sometimes in those letters, he talked about those friends so many times that we actually know who they are. Titus and Timothy, Silas and Barnabas. He talked about his friends so many times in the letters that he wrote. But then when he left a community, he would send letters back to them. And say like, hey, I hear you guys are doing great. I'm so happy for you. I'm so proud of you. And then sometimes he would hear that they weren't doing so great. And he would say like, I'm holding you in my heart. I'm lifting you in my prayers. And here's some advice on how you can do things better. Because if the Apostle Paul was anything, it was someone who liked to tell you how you should live your life. <laughs> but even in those letters, he would often say, hey, if this letter gets passed around to, to, to Phoebe or to Felicia, please tell her that I miss her and I want to see her again. The next time that I'm there, we'll get together. He was constantly talking about his friends in his letters. And when he got into real trouble, which he did a lot, which me as a minister gives me some license to get into some real trouble too, which I kind of did, which I kind of did, it was his friends who bailed him out. And he was constantly bailing out his friends. So it's all about relationships, Rex, Johnny, Marie. That is where you find your meaning in life. Now, I know you guys are going to be successful. You're going to shake up the world like Muhammad Ali. I shook up the world! <laughs> I know you guys are going to do that. And by whatever metrics the society wants to place and say what is a success or not a success, you will be judged as a success. I have no doubt about it. But accomplishments, success, those things don't really bring happiness. They're fleeting. It's our relationships that give us joy. So one true meaning... Our one true meaning is found in relationships. And if I can boil down all of the biblical scriptures, Hebrew and Christian, into one concept, it's this. You are never alone. And we are meant to be in true, authentic, loving relationship with God, with each other, and with the earth. So Marie, Johnny, and Rex... What I want to say to you today is that you may think that you're connected. Technology is so amazing these days that we are connected with people all around the world. But we are not necessarily in relationship with these people. And even though the world is, has become the small global village, people have try, will try to make sure that you fit into one group, into one tribe, into one community. And they'll tell you that you can't hang out and you shouldn't be friends with those people over there. And you've got to transcend that. When you go to Berkeley and Boston, or you go to Berkeley in the Bay Area, or you stay here in the Berkeley of San Diego, Miramar College, <laughs> you need to know that people are going to try to break you down and put you into a group. Just like you're going to have to declare a, 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 declare a major, they're going to ask you to declare a tribe. 
and they're going to ask you to stay within that tribe, to declare the camp that you're in and never mix with those over there. They do this. They'll either say you have to be either pro-police, black the, uh, back the blue, or you have to be anti-police. Black lives matter. And those two things aren't mutually exclusive. They're going to have to say, like, you have to have to be pro-choice or pro-life. And that's a political divide in this political environment that they try to, like, wedge people for decades. And you have to say no to that and deal with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis and build true relationships. So I would say, turn off the TV. Get off your social network media stream and start building authentic relationships with people. True, loving relationships. Now your parents would hate it if I went through this whole thing and didn't tell you to study hard. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, study hard. <laughs> Do good. But more than focusing on your studies, on your goals, on your future, those are all great things, and you should focus on those things. But what I really want you to focus on is don't neglect your family. When your mom calls, pick up the phone. Text her every once in a while. Send her a selfie. Let her know that you love her and that you miss her. As you study, use what you learn to discern what is right and wrong and that your goals might not mirror up with the, the goals of our culture, which is built around production and consumption and competition. Those things are not life-giving. Relationships are. And all in all, when it's all said and done, if you focus on love and the virtue of true, authentic relationships, I promise you, when that time comes, whenever it is, and you're about to breathe your last, and your life flashes before your eyes, and you see that you've had great, amazing friends who have been with you till the end, you'll say, I lived a life full of meaning, and you won't have a single regret. Good luck. Many blessings. I love you with all my heart. I say that as your friend. Amen. <laughs>